Good evening, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. We'll let everyone make their way into the uh, into the room. I'm excited tonight. We have two wonderful presenters. Um, so this is going to be a very exciting one. A reminder: this is a two-hour presentation, right, everybody? We're here for for two hours. So if you need, go get your uh, your your glass of wine, your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, whatever it might be, and we're here for the long haul. So. Without further ado, I know we have a lot of information to get to in the next two hours. Um, welcome to tonight's Wu University event, Integrative and Functional Medicine, New Opportunities for Optometry with Dr. Tracy Offerdahl and Dr. Greg Caldwell. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. I found it. <laughs> I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. And just some reminders for each hour of CE, attendees must be online for a minimum of 50 minutes. So double that because we're here for two hours. For a COPE certificate, please fill out a survey link in the chat. The survey link will also appear when the webinar ends. CE certificates will be delivered by email and sent to Arbo with OE tracker numbers. We'll also display a QR code at the end of the event if you have the OE tracker app on your phone. CE certificates will be emailed within four weeks. Make sure you ask questions using the Zoom on-screen floating panels. This duo loves questions. They love an interactive group. So don't wait till the end of the two hours because it's hard to remember those questions. If you have questions, put them in the chat. If I, if I've, I've moderated many, many events with uh, these two wonderful presenters. So they love interaction and they love questions throughout. So make sure you put those in when you think of it. It's supposed to be virtual synchronous, right? Yes. So it's supposed to be synchronous. Let's make yes. it synchronous. So if you're on a mobile device, you can find Q&A at the top and you can find chat behind those three dots. So I have the pleasure tonight of once again, introducing Dr. Tracy Offerdahl. She attend, I should have this memorized by now. <laughs> <laughs> she attended Temple University School of Pharmacy in Philadelphia, PA for both her undergraduate and graduate degrees. Upon completion of her Doctor of Pharmacy degree, she completed a residency at Temple University Hospital. She's currently on faculty at Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salis University in the Department of Optometry, where she's the course director and instructor for all systemic pharmacology courses for students in the optometry, audiology, and physician assistant programs. Additionally, she's a practicing clinical pharmacist, and she's a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry. Welcome again, Dr. Offerdahl. Thank you. And these uh, are her financial disclosures. Yes, nothing to disclose. <laughs> and we have two tonight. So I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Greg Caldwell. He's a 1995 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. He currently works in Duncansville, Pennsylvania as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and he's been a participant in multiple FDA investigations and trials. Dr. Caldwell has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care. He practices integrative optometry. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. This year, the POA awarded Dr. Caldwell Chairman of the Year for his work for the Third Party Committee. He's a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He's lectured extensively throughout the country and over 13 countries internationally. Welcome, Dr. Caldwell. Thanks, Jen, and that was very nice of you to read that, so thank you. These, these are my disclosures here, but really what I want to point out is everything has been mitigated through COPE and all the regulatory bodies. All right, so thanks, Jen. Thanks for that great introduction, and Tracy, thanks again for sharing the, the virtual podium uh, tonight. So uh, Tracy is, uh, well, Tracy, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself, uh, clinical pharmacist practicing in the school. I'll tell a little bit about myself and we'll jump in here. Yeah. So probably uh, some of you have heard me speak before, but a uh, practicing clinical pharmacist with an integrative practice 
um, in Pennsylvania, and I've been teaching optometry students uh, since 2006, both um, uh, systemic as well as some ocular pharmacology as well. So, Trace, I think it'd be important tonight to basically, I know you and I are friends, you're in the Philly area, I'm in the Pittsburgh area, Western Central, um, so I see a lot, but uh, I think, you know, I know kind of how you practice, and I know you've told me at times where um, you'll, you will say, look, I'm a pharmacist, but man, if I can keep people off of medicine, so I think that will go well here tonight with this lecture, so why don't you just take two seconds or whatever and explain that? So. Yeah, sure. So uh, I went into pharmacy because I loved chemistry and biochemistry, and it just was a nice match. I know I'm one of those weird people that loves biochemistry, um, and I'm fascinated by drugs. Uh, but my issue with drugs, particularly in the United States and Western medicine model in general, is that we have a drug for everything. Uh, we have a drug for the original indication, and then we have another drug for a side effect that the original drug caused. And while we have drugs, and we certainly are a, a, you know, a, a very blessed country in that regard, um, my issue is when we are thinking, you know, I'm only going to use a drug or, um, you know, the only thing we have available is a drug with no other interventions or recommendations, et cetera. So I'm, I'm anti only drug. I'm anti always drug. Um, and certainly, you know, what, what's the latest statistic? 6.8% of the American uh, public is metabolically healthy. That's a problem. And that certainly fits into our topic for tonight. Yeah, and so how I got into this was, you know, years ago, people were coming up to me saying, can I take resveratrol for macular degeneration? Can I take quercetin? Can I take, you know, this polyphenol, this anthocyan, and so on and so forth? And I would say to the patient, I don't know, K-N-O-W. I didn't say no. I said, I don't know. Let me look into it. Let me look into it. And eventually I said, well, I keep telling people I look into it. I better look into it. And it was like unearthing a tree. And... I'm glad I did because I kind of learned a whole other part of medicine in the sense, functional medicine, which we'll talk about more tonight. With that being said, most of us are in our comfort zone here. And so we want to get out of that comfort zone. We have to get into a fear zone. We have to get where we have to have courage and commitment to be able to do something more capable and get into a learning zone. And then we get into that growth zone. So hopefully tonight, um, Tracy and I will inspire you to go on and do more because I've been studying this now for eight, six to eight years. Um, I can certainly boil it down, uh, but it's, you'll probably have to do a little bit more or Tracy and I can help you if you want to, you know, get more into more functional medicine. With that being said, you heard about Tracy, my background, I think a lot of people will know I grew up, you know, helping pass laws in Pennsylvania. The only thing I could do when I graduated in 1995 was dilate. And then we passed law in 1996, 2002. We got steroids and allergy and orals and opioids and all this great stuff. Um, I became this allopathic ocular disease teaching OCT and visual fields, dark adaptation which was all fun. I grew up in an allopathic, but now I can speak the second language of functional medicine, uh, which we're going to talk about. So when it comes to, you know, functional medicine, um, there's all kinds of avenues. We're going to kind of focus on nutrition tonight. And because of our food sources, you're going to hear us talk about how bad, um, you know, the food sources are in times and why they're bad. But if we take a supplement, they always have these claims on here. And Trace, I think this would probably be more for you to explain as the pharmacist. Why do they put these different claims on? So the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has several categories. And of course, the most obvious one is drugs versus dietary supplements. So in the U.S., uh, the Food and Drug Administration says that the only thing that can claim to cure, prevent, or treat a disease is a drug. So something that comes um, from a pharmaceutical company that has gone through um, you know, uh, in, in vitro studies, small, uh, animals, and then in phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials gets approved and then, you know, is marketed. So anything that is considered to be alternative or holistic or, you know, kind of quote unquote functional, it is against the law. It is illegal to make claims of curing, preventing, or treating diseases or conditions, which, which really is just galling when you think about it. But, you know, my opinion on that is it's competition for pharmaceuticals. So, you know, the biggest thing we see right now are the peptides that are out there, which are wonderful. I love peptides. And certainly we need Ozempic, Wegovy, 
um, Manjaro, ZepBound, all of those. And there are many more drugs that are peptides that are wonderful. Um, but we probably have an equal number, if not more, peptides that, you know, have beneficial therapeutic, um, you know, mechanisms available as dietary supplements and they, and they cannot be marketed or sold or indicated in, you know, any advertising that they can treat, prevent, or cure a disease. So dietary supplements are not intended according to our U S food and drug administration to treat, diagnose, mitigate, prevent, or cure disease. And you can get in big trouble for saying that, well, we can say it as practitioners. We just can't put it in our, our advertising or probably maybe wear it on a t-shirt, except for when we're at home scrubbing toilets, maybe then we can get away with it. There you go. So, you know, when it, Tracy and I do this uh, presentation live with the audience, we'll say to the audience, hey, how many of you think like red rice yeast or some supplement out there can treat, like red rice yeast is good for cholesterol, helps, you know, balance the cholesterol is the good and the bad. How many, out, you know, feel that some supplement can treat with high blood pressure or cholesterol or help with diabetes and so on and so forth, regulate the sugars, 90% of the audience will raise the hand. So, you know, I think a lot of us out there as healthcare professionals believe that there are supplements other than you say allopathic type of medications that can help. So again, we're going to talk about that. So this is why you see that we will say that a supplement does not treat, cure a cell membrane, but a supplement will support a cell membrane, will support the immune system, support oxidative stress. We're gonna hit that a lot tonight to that extracellular matrix and the cells talk to each other. We're gonna talk about a ton of this tonight. We're gonna talk about the cell membrane. We're gonna talk about the immune system. We're gonna talk about oxidative stress and signaling. And guess what? They all need vitamin A, vitamin B, polyphenols, flavonoids, carotenoids out there. So you'll see why Tracy and I are big on a comprehensive antioxidant support. Now, I think this is, you know, optometry's opportunity that's out there. You heard me say about passing laws and going out and fighting in Pennsylvania. We could still go get some lasers, but how far are we going to go? I truly, in my functional medicine studies and talking with Tracy, um, we believe that optometry's opportunity as people come to us when they're presbyopic, having a tough time seeing, we're really sometimes the first time they're getting plugged into the healthcare system, that antioxidants, which is oxidative stress, gut health, which we'll touch on a little bit. And now we're doing this skin care. We're doing uh, IPL and we're doing these different low light therapies out there where we can target would be maybe with a good collagen with, you know, Tracy and I, we, we advocate for this one collagen that has an active peptide in it. We, we we're probably going to develop a gut health lecture soon, but tonight we're going to focus on antioxidants, right? We get these from our foods. Our food sources are going to be pretty terrible. So we're going to hear how, why we believe, you know, taking a supplement that's out there. Tracy, anything to add to this slide before I move on? Nope. Okay. Okay. So you know, when it comes down to what I've learned is that, you know, the body likes to be yin and yang. So we have the sympathetic uh, system, right? Yeah, the fight and flight. But then we have the rest and digest with the parasympathetic system. So we hear stress the body. That's that is exercise. The parasympathetic gets your sleep, right? There's such a big focus on sleep. And, you know, I heard someone in the lecture the other day and my jaw almost dropped. They were talking about the glymphatic, not the lymphatic, but the glymphatic system, which is a system where our brain opens up the channels that get rid of those toxins. So that's why we have to get into those different levels of sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, and allow that brain to recover. Breathing. I'm going to hit my parasympathetic right now because I know my sympathetic is up and because I'm doing a lecture. So I'm going to hit that diaphragm, take that deep breath, and poof, I just kind of felt a little relaxing here. So sympathetic, parasympathetic, and then on top of that, nutrition. And it's like a bar stool. You take away the exercise, you become sedentary, we know what happens. If we become too much sleep, too much parasympathetic, we know what happens. We know what happens when we get too much nutrition or if we get poor nutrition. So that's kind of the overall kind of three pillars and we're going to focus on that nutrition tonight. Tracy, anything you want to do there? Okay. Right. So I have attended, and so has Tracy, One of this is one of our favorite meetings. It's called 
the it's called the A4M, the American Academy. That's your first two M's, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And it's in Vegas, and I'm going to be heading there this year. I think Tracy's going to be going out with me. And this is a bunch of MDs, DOs, pharmacists, optometrists, nurse practitioners, nutritionists, that anyone really in the healthcare system that thought that they were getting into healthcare. But when they finally got figured out what they were doing, it was sick care because everyone was getting going to the doctor when they were sick. So this whole society, which is in its 32nd year, formed the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M. And we attend this. And this was James Laval. And he was talking. But this was the theme. Almost every lecture I go to, they talk about oxidative stress and inflammation. It's usually at the top, and that's what we're focusing on tonight in this presentation. Hormonal, hormonal balance, stress hormones, glucose regulation, gut. You hear you heard me say about that being an opportunity. Immune balance, and then that environmental exposure or the epigenetics, and then individuality. That's really the big thing that we talk about in functional medicine. If you think about uh, randomized clinical trials. You know, I'll just pick on Allergan for back in the day when Lumigan was being launched. And Tracy talked about these phase three trials and you put 500 people in it and you that's heterogeneous, 500 people. And you come out and you say, well, it lowered by 9.1 for for the people. And that's a homogeneous outcome. Um, so we do that a lot in randomized clinical trials. And that's the kind of the gold standard. But in functional medicine, it's really risk-adjusted medicine, informed risk-adjusted medicine, and we'll touch on that. So tonight, really, from this is kind of functional medicine, all the hormones, the gut, individuality, immune system, we're going to focus on this and inflammation and oxidative stress. I did a thyroid lecture and was explaining about, you know, the immune system, how it's autoimmune, and these antibodies are attacking the fat and the muscle, and then I was talking about how I focus on using supplements for those patients. And Barry uh, Schumann here called me immediately. He's like, oh, my gosh, that was so refreshing that you did that. And he wrote this paper um, about lifespan and health span. And our lifespan is you know, to when we expire. But in America, as you can see here, about age 60, it says here 63, it would say we live to 80 what happens in America is our health span separates from our lifespan. And what we want to try and do is keep that health span on top of our lifespan, right? We all hear of, you know, the 103 grandma that was out shoveling the driveway, you know, a week before she passed away. And she kind of, you know, hey, my legs are starting to turn a funny color. And, you know, they, they pass away maybe from the, from the feet up. Right, but that was a very se short separation of the health span from the lifespan that's out there. And chronic disease in America just causes us to have this separation of health span and lifespan. And this is just a classic example. I don't know who this lady is. I fly out of Pittsburgh a lot and it's a terminal and you gotta go down and get on this tram, at least for another year, because you're doing a big remodel. And you get on this train, you ride out, and then you get out to your car in your parking lot. And again, I don't know if this lady had hip surgery, knee surgery, ankle surgery, fell down. Maybe she could go out and move. But this was a classic example of her, to me, the health span separating from the lifespan. You know, I walk from the terminal to my car. This person can't get, you know, from the airplane you know, to this, you know, to the escalator, to the train, and out to the car. So the health span is the the yeah the health span is separating from the lifespan. So that's just a classic example. We see it all the time. I saw it with my dad, and so what I'm trying to do is everyone usually has a story. So I want to keep my health span on top of my lifespan. Trace, anything you want to add from where I was covering? Yeah. So you just look at drugs. I mean, you know, we can put someone on you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 20. I, the, I have one patient who's literally on 20, 23 oral meds and three injectable meds. And he's uh, 67 and he already, you know, acts like he's an 82 year old. And um, I've known him for many, many years, 30 years, actually 32. And it's just, once again, you know, for every single ailment, there's a drug that can that can help with that ailment. The problem is you end up with more years, but no quality to those years. 
So we can make you live forever limping along, but you know, who wants to, who wants to live long limping along. Right. And that's the problem. It becomes a quality issue, not a quantity issue. What do they always say? Live, young, live younger, longer, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And that's kind yep. of the, one of the mottos of functional medicine. You want to talk about uh, how patients are expecting this trace? Yeah. So, you know, uh, a lot of different disciplines in medicine, uh, well, a growing number of disciplines in medicine um, understand this model of what patients are expecting and, and what we should be providing, whether they're expecting it or not, early detection, wellness, and prevention. Um, we all know that the Western model of medicine is uh, very lax in what it pays for. Uh, I mean, even in treatment, but certainly in prevention. Um, but more and more insurance companies are advocating different wellness opportunities for their patients. So COVID was a huge impetus for people just thinking, oh my gosh, here's this virus swirling around the world and I have absolutely nothing I can do about it. I can't lose 50 pounds, you know, by the time the virus gets to where I live, I can't, I can't do anything. But what I can do is improve my nutrition, get some rest, get some exercise and maybe supplement. So really, there was a huge push. Uh, as a matter of fact, within five days of, of the world knowing about supplements, all the antioxidant supplements were pretty much sold out on Amazon. So from it was the time interesting. COVID hit, right? Yeah, what's that? From the time COVID hit? Yep, from the time COVID, COVID hit. Yep, so uh, people sort of understood, you know, as the data was coming out, that those at highest risk, highest risk were those that were, you know, had comorbidities, multimorbidities, um, particularly, uh, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and, um, you know, obesity. So it really has been a wonderful uh, boon, the virus itself, the pandemic itself was a rather, you know, wonderful boon to really this early detection, wellness and prevention in a lot of patients as well as practitioners. Yeah, I usually whenever, you know, I talk about this slide is that, you know, I usually bring up and it happened today and I'll tell you how it happened. You know, I'll, someone will come in for their diabetic eye exam and they'll say, you know, you know, I say, you don't have any retinopathy back here. I'm doing all this, you know, early detection testing. And they'll say, how can I keep it that way? That's words people are saying. So patients are expecting, how can I keep it that way? Um, I had, a, a, I had a, a mom and son in today. He was 50 years old. Mom was, you know, 70 something. And I'm showing him the Drews and the atrophy. And he, this was his first time in. And and I have her treated at a very high level, a multivitamin, a low dose zinc, so on and so forth. And I examined him and I said, the good news is I don't see anything here. We can do some genetic testing. And he said to me, how can I keep it that way? And I said, you know, you had your hand on the scanner. Your score is low. We're going to talk about that here. And we were able to implement an antioxidant strategy or an anti-inflammatory strategy uh, today with him discussing those three pillars. Um, so early detection, we have it in optometry all over the place. Um, here's genetic testing. We're going to talk a little bit about the arms and the complement factor H tonight. Um, I have the uh, dark adaptation. I had both both dark adaptation because I had the HERU visual field in my practice. Then they went dark adaptation. but still functional. They're, no, they're not existing right now, but I can still play around with it. But I still have the maculogics. And that finds changes or, you know, macular degeneration three years before Drusen. What I see when people, if they don't have a good functional background, is, okay, what do I do with that, right? Oh, you could put some carotenoids on it, which is a good start, but I think we can do more than that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. VEP uh, and ERG testing, uh, Rabin cone contrast testing, great for early detection and progression of glaucoma, macular degeneration, uh, diabetic retinopathy. But if you catch these things early, You'd better have a good understanding of what we're talking about tonight to really help the patient out. And to me, it goes beyond carotenoids uh, like lutein and zeaxanthin. So here's a scanner that I use in the practice. Tracy can talk about how she uses it in her pharmacy. Um, it measures carotenoids, right? So let me just run through this real quick. You know, we disclosed in our uh, in our beginning that you know, I'm a uh, uh, I'm an affiliation with. Pharmanex, Tracy's affiliated with Pharmanex. We'll talk maybe a little bit of where we, why we follow on that as we get through some slides. They have a scanner, okay? So does Mackey Health. So do you, if you've used, I believe, I promise now is the owner of the MPOD, macular pigment optical density. 
You can use whatever scanner you want. The biomarker they're using is carotenoids. What Tracy and I want to go out and try to remind people is that you can see this girl has her hand on the scanner. In 30 seconds or less, it's going to measure the carotenoid level. So you're measuring carotenoids and you're going to get a score. This is a bad score. Let me go over here. This is an A+, plus, A, B, C, D, E. When I scan my patients, I want them on the right side, not the left side, because the left side is telling me they have inflammation in the body. And you can spin that roulette wheel of inflammation. Is it cancer? Is it cardiovascular? Is it diabetes, arthritis? Is it some eye problem, macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts, dry eye, whatever all those inflammatory components, earlier onset of diabetes, so on and so forth, diabetic retinopathy. So you can see these two people I'm not happy with. Over here on this side, you're, you're, you are setting yourself up with chronic inflammation. And what I tell patients when I cross them over to the green and we want them in the blue, but if they get to the green, now we are stacking the deck in their favor and minimizing that. Now, what I want to point out with the scanners is that it measures carotenoids. And I always slow this down whenever I'm at a live audience and I say to the audience, if you are low in your carotenoids, now remember, carotenoids are one part of the antioxidant system. You have polyphenols, you have flavonoids, carotenoids, vitamin A, vitamin D, all the minerals, so on and so forth. With that whole antioxidant network, if you scan and you're low in carotenoids, do you think just by dumb luck, you're just low in carotenoids and your polyphenols and your flavonoids and the rest of your antioxidant system is, is spot on? And the answer is no, because that's where the studies show. And I can give you a study and show you studies and so on and so forth. But the key is the carotenoid is the biomarker, the result of the test through serum. And they literally took skin samples, ground them up and put them into all those fancy, I don't know, liquid cr chromatographers or whatever they do, and showed that the all the antioxidant network is low. So that's why we in functional medicine are big on measuring the carotenoids. You're going to hear about how it's a predictive biomarker, and that's why functional medicine does that, but it's showing you that you're low in everything. If you do an MPOD in the eye and someone's low in their macular pigment, they're probably low in everything else. That has been shown that through serum testing and through the uh, different type of skin testing, whatever scanner you want to use, Raman spectroscopy, uh, reflectance, whatever you're doing to measure, if you're low, please hear me out on this. You're low in everything else. All right, Trace, what did I miss or what do you want to say? Oh, no, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I didn't really sort of buy into the whole process um you know the the science behind it for sure but um you know it, it certainly proved me to be wrong and uh this is what i do in my patients as well and it's it's just a game changer for people with all kinds of chronic diseases and for those that uh, wish to prevent it you know have a, a family history or the beginning of it so a question came in does the scanner use visible light uh what about dark pigmented uh, patients that's a great question out there bruce mm -hmm. Um, you know, Paul Bernstein is is going to be the leading expert to speak on this. I've listened to all his stuff that's out there. Um, I'm not going to geek out on this too much, but, you know, Raman spectroscopy, uh, it's something like 478 um, uh, yellow and blue make green, right? So uh, it's blue light hitting a yellow carotenoid. So the blue at 478 carotenoids are yellow. So I don't know, I guess it's it's visible light because if I look at the scanner, I can see the blue. So it's blue visible light at 478 hitting carotenoids and bouncing back a very specific green light. That is kind of the Nobel Prize Raman spectroscopy. It's also reflectance out there. Um, and that's why the scanner that was, you know, the, it, the it's the life meter, the veggie meter previously, it can be influenced by hemoglobin and pigment. And that's why it squeezes. But take that all away. I don't care how you measure, just interpret it out there. I'm not really sure how uh, uh, reflectance works, um, but I do know that it's measuring the amount of carotenoid, uh, Raman spectroscopy, and then the MPOD is using light and the patient is using, uh, you know, it's a subjective test uh, that's out there. So the scanner that we use is visible light that's out there. Tracy, you use it in, the, in your pharmacy, is that correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
So she measures the patients. Sometimes the patients come in and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, what supplement do you recommend? So Tracy and I have had those comment. Com and I uh, call it the uh, supplement lie detector. It's the nutritional lie detector test. And it's also the supplement lie detector test because there are, you know, several really great companies for supplements um, that have p incredibly pure products, um, you know, in, in terms of purity and stability, et cetera there's probably a half dozen that I would say, yep, the, the greatest, the most superior out there. The problem is very few companies actually test their supplements bioavailability in human beings. And that is where the rubber meets the road. It can be pure as the driven snow and, you know, a descend from heaven itself. But if it is not bioavailable in the human body, what's the point? You know, it's, it's the old adage that you're just making expensive urine or very expensive bowel movements. So, you know, that in and of itself is is really the end point that we have to come to some agreement. There, you know, there are only a couple of companies out there that make bioavailable supplements. And this is a kind of a good way of, you know, they're, they're, the company that we use and there's other companies out there that have done studies on there to show the bioavailability. But I tell a patient, look, if you're putting it in your mouth and two months later your score goes up, I think you're absorbing. So I think that's a pretty easy way of, of putting it out there. Benjamin, I see your question here. I will chat with that in a second. Let me just kind of explain here. You know, this is a low score. This is a high score. OK, so low scores is 19. Remember, it splits in half. This is what it looks like. This is your, your cell membrane right here. Remember your phospholipid bilayer membrane? It's, you know, it's, it's phospholipid, fat lipid. Um, we're going to talk about real quick here. That's why we need to have our omega-3s and our omega-6s. Those are essential. When you hear the word essential, that means your body cannot manufacture them. You have to eat them. And that's why all these channels here and all these pores and all these different receptors need to have the right balance of you know minerals for that cell signaling so on and so forth but let me just talk about omegas here real quick omega threes and omega sixes the sixes get thrown under the bus they shouldn't the body likes to be in balance we are supposed to have sixes that are pro-inflammatory but the threes balance them out we don't get threes in our american diet so that's why we they quickly become pro-inflammatory if we do the threes it balances out the sixes but that makes that cell membrane pliable and makes it ready to be laced with those fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin E is fat soluble. Vitamin C is water soluble. So it goes to the inside and the outside of a cell. And then you add in all the other antioxidants here. I just put beta carotene, lutein and lycopene. Just imagine the whole antioxidant network. I'm going to reverse it. This is a low score. Tracy's going to talk about free radicals. A free radical comes in. It's going to hit the DNA. It's going to hit the nucleus. It's going to hit the cell. It's going to damage the cell. It wants to be balanced. When we are properly antioxidant, this is the way our cells look. This is a high score. This is a low score. This is the way we don't want to look. This is the way we want to look with a higher score. If you score low on carotenoids, this is what it's saying your cell membranes look like. Whatever device you use, MPOD, the MacuHealth one, the Pharmanex one, whatever you're using to scan, you are low in everything. So we want to replace in everything. So that kind of leads me into what Benjamin has here. It says, as an optometrist, how detailed are you going into counseling your patients who have low carotenoids? Are you making a general broad recommendation discussing PCP? recommending diet changes. So all of that is correct, Benjamin. So I scan everyone that comes into practice. If they're low, I say I'm concerned with their score. I'm concerned because there's low grade inflammation and I have a great multivitamin that will, which is more than a multivitamin. It's a comprehensive bone support, immune support, multivitamin that will help raise their score and it mimics eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. With that being said, I don't have to fold in the PCP because which PCP, unless they're super sick or on warfarin or something to that effect, but my 50 year old person, I just say eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. It's two packs a day, one in the morning with your everyday bodily function, your, 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 your peeing, your pooping, your hair is growing, your fingernails are growing, you're eating, you're digesting. And then the other one gives you the protection. And it's a really short conversation that's out there. 
How much do scanners cost? How much do scanners cost? Uh, not much, less than $3,000, I think, to implement, but we could talk about that if you want uh, off, off uh, Joseph, because we don't want to turn um, this into Mackey Health or uh, PharmaNex or, you know, I promise uh, scanner sales. Let's talk about the nutrition. But I know from the from the scanner we use, about $3,000 or less. All right. So with that being said, comprehensive versus isolate. So I saw this on LinkedIn. So I screenshot it and it says, what does nutrition have to do with brain health? Um, and I think if we just think back about the, the Optometric Glaucoma Society, which I'm amazed by, there's a society that's been around for 30 years, over a a ganglion cell and an axon. So remember this, just think about, you know, we measure ganglion cell complex with our OCT. The ganglion cell complex is right outside our macula. And then that axon goes through the nerve fiber layer, through the neuroretinal rim, through the lamina cribosa, becomes myelinated through the orbital fissure, through the chiasm and synapses. We're way back into the brain now. We synapse in the lateral geniculate body. Cell body right here, ganglion cell, and pretend this axon has just went through all that whole track I just told you, nerve fiber layer, optic nerve, through the orbital fissure, chiasm, and synapses in the lateral geniculate body. So that's why we say, you know, when we look at the eye, the eye is brain and so on and so forth, because that starts in the eye, but goes to the brain and synapses. But I thought it was amazing that uh, this was pretty cool that she's talking about what does nutrition and brain health have to do? So you want to keep those brain axons and ganglion cells healthy. Homocysteine metabolism, you get out of balance, it becomes inflammatory, but you want to keep it balanced. So we need B9, B12, riboflavin, which is B6, choline over here, energy. We need CoQ10, iron, neurotransmitters. We have B6. Uh, down here, we have blood flow, polyphenols, flavonoids. Here we have the cell membrane, should make sense. You need the omegas, EPA, DHA, there's your omega-3s. My point is, you see how comprehensive this is? So when I see an eye care, you know, we have an optic nerve formula and we have a dry eye formula and we have a, this formula and a, that formula. I kind of think we just need to kind of cover everything with, um, with a comprehensive versus an isolate. Tracy, I'll let you kind of speak on that if you have any thoughts. Yeah, no, I agree. And I I guess I don't call the, well, first of all, you know, I choose things based upon the product itself and how it works and, you know, the biomarkers that we can um, evaluate based upon products. And, um, you know, the company that it comes from is really secondary. You know, we choose, make decisions based upon products themselves and the outcomes that we can produce that are reproducible as well. Um, as it pertains to comprehensive versus isolating, it's one of the things when I started teaching in optometry in 2006, you know, the more I really got to, to understand about this functional approach and, you know, Greg will get more into this as well with lutein zeaxanthin, even mesozeaxanthin being really, you know, an inner retina preventive and, and treatment modality. You know, I'm a systemic medicine person, so it never really... I, I never really fully understood why we wouldn't want to address something that really is an end organ issue with the eye, uh, whether it's geographic atrophy, glaucoma, or everything in between, um, without a systemic approach. I mean, I understand it as, you know, I guess from an optometrist perspective, but it really made more sense. Why wouldn't we just comprehensively find something that would make a difference? And then you are augmenting inflammation and oxidative stress in the entire body and therefore you would see it in the eye as well so that's kind of my thought behind this approach okay perfect so tracy talked about the macular pigment and i love macular pigment and to me it's a foveal pigment as you can see with this confocal uh raman mic microscopy here and I'd like to show, this is the oxidative stress. We're going to talk about the mitochondria here of the OCT. You know, we, lutein and zeaxanthin are super important for our eye, right? And we're showing it here. It's the third lens of the eye, the cornea, the crystalline lens. The fovea is curved. It's a lens, and we put some no glare on it, right? I do no glare for my patients all the time. We understand the benefits. It lets more light through, the protection of the blue blocking, so on and so forth. We do it with our glasses. 
and we're doing it in our fovea here. And you can see it all it goes down to where those cones are right there in that foveola. Remember, this whole thing is the macula, right? When you look at these scans of OCTs, this, this whole thing is the macula. And we're talking about building up lutein and zeaxanthin. To me, it's super important. You need it for, you know, the blue light absorption, for increased contrast sensitivity. I just think we put a little too much weight on the protection. It does protect. I'm not going to say it. The science is out there. And carotenoids are one of the very first line ubiquitous types of, of, of protection out there. But in pharmacology, when you have everything else involved, it is, is synergism that's out there. So I just always like to point out, again, there's plenty of evidence out there that shows you where this macular pigment is. And the disease, it seems to be a nice crossover and easy discussion with macular degeneration. This is where macular degeneration is. If we build up this layer, we probably should be doing a little bit more here with this foveal pigment. So, you know, do we care about the photoreceptors, the rest of the retina? I think we all do. We always see these kind of printouts here of, you know, as Tracy mentioned, lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, super important, super important for that phobia, for that macula uh, that's out there. But we need to do that. And I think when we have people with, with disease and inflammation in their body, in their eye, we can take it a step further and add something else to it is all we're saying. You know, Tracy, back in the day, we've been lecturing, ooh, Tracy, I'm not sure if we want to admit it, maybe it's 10 or 15 years now, but when we were lecturing in pharmacology, she told me, Greg, you got to get good at the immune system, you got to understand receptors. And was she ever so right over all these years? I learned about the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, the, now the complement system that's out there, the membrane attack complex. Again, I saw this on LinkedIn, and I'm just going to start this and hit play that purple are the T cells. Look how active they are, and they're attacking this cancer cell. So these T cells in our immune system have to be spot on. They have to recognize that that's cancer, not a uh, another type of cell in our body. So if our immune system starts to get confused, if it's if it's oxidatively stressed, the immune system can become oxidatively stressed then it just doesn't play the right way. So again, the immune system is super complex. It's it's super amazing. But remember, in, in functional medicine, we talked about you know oxidative stress, gut. We talked about hormones. And we have to kind of keep that immune system not overactive, not underactive, just kind of, just kind of happy. And I remember Tracy saying, even if you take an aspirin, the body goes, ah, and it starts to be like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Um, and so that immune system needs to be important. But Tracy, anything you want to add? Immune system receptors uh, that's out there? I'll just make the comment. If you've ever heard me lecture on anything related to this topic, um, the body is never happy a drug is there. Never. There's not a single drug in all of drug dumb, which is my drug kingdom. Uh, that that will make the body happy. I mean, it could be, I mean, if you're talking about drugs of addiction, that's a little bit different, but I'm saying from a, um, you, you know, metabolic breakdown, uh, metabolism, biotransformation, elimination, et cetera, you could be having an anaphylactic reaction to a, a peanut and someone is giving you IV corticosteroids and epinephrine, and even that your body is freaking out, hitting that you know big red button, the threat level midnight button, uh, if you like the office, and um, saying, oh no, you know I, I made perfectly, I have everything I need. This is the human body speaking. I have everything I need to do exactly what needs to be done at any moment in time. So it identifies every single drug as a you know foreign entity that it will work like hell to break it down and eliminate it as quick as possible and when you really stop and think about that i mean drugs are necessary for sure but the more we use them the more we pile on the more we really realize that it is causing in another additional layer of stress that you know sometimes we have no choice but if we can use prevention and try to use other treatments, it really is beneficial on all levels. Perfect. All right. I already saw that video. Let's play this. So kind of a nice little segue. End organ, you know, damage. We see, you know, we have diabetes and end organ damage would be diabetic retinopathy. We see end organ damage all the time from oxidative stress, dry eye. We always talk about the fish oil, but there's plenty of, you know, I treat with, you know, patient has a low scanner, they have dry eye, I want to raise their score because we're talking about all the cytokines, the interleukins 
that are being formed that we can maybe balance out with a good supplement. Uh, floaters, you know, it's it's basically oxidized uh, uh, vitreous in the, and it starts to collapse. I think we know macular degeneration. Glaucoma, I'm going to show you how the trabecular mesh work becomes sticky. And when it becomes sticky and maybe the pressure goes up and then collapses Slem's canal, now it drives the pressure up. Or it becomes sticky and clogs up a collector channel. Remember, aqueous goes through the trabecular mesh work. Slem's canal, collector channel, episclerovenous venous system, superior and inferior veins into the cavernous sinus. It needs to drain out. And we're going to show you a slide from the airy slide deck when I used to do back in the day of Notarsidil programs and Rocklatan, I thought it was really cool. And then it kind of plugged into some of the functional stuff that I was studying, diabetes and autoimmune disease. Again, supporting the cell membrane, supporting that immune system, which is macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is nothing more than an autoimmune disease that's out there. Uh, oxidative stress, extracellular matrix, glaucoma, cell signaling that's out there. Again, glaucoma, we're talking about trabecular mesh work in glaucoma. We're talking about the ganglion cell in the axon going all the way back to that lateral geniculate body. So we can really support many levels uh, with our patients. Now, this is a fun question to do whenever I say, or do, you, do you consider yourself an interactive optometrist? And it's kind of funny and I kind of slow it down in the, in the live meeting. And I see how many people raise their hand, you know, in a, in a meeting of a hundred people, you get like a few people kind of, I think I am, or you get a couple people, I know I am. And then hundred people, you have like six or seven. So then I'll say, does anyone out here do A-Reds vitamins, any type of vitamin, omegas that are out there, plenty of companies making the omegas, vital tears, drawing out the blood. Uh, they, they either could send them to a site, they come to the office, they draw the blood out spin it around and turn it into eye drops, regenerize amniotic membrane, tea tree oil, hypochlorous acid, which would have been Avanova. You know, some are doing probiotics whenever they give an antibiotic or an antiviral. Then I'll say, how many have done that? And the whole audience raises their hand. And I say, well, don't really know that what you're doing in a sense. I say it jokingly. And I say, because there is nothing that is allopathic about giving someone omega-3s, EPA, DHA, drawing up a blood, taking a placenta, tea tree oil, hypochlorous acid is what comes out of a white blood cell when someone gets an infection. When you get, a, a, when you get sick and your white blood cells go out, it's so it can leak out more hypochlorous acid to help kill, kill those bugs. It's part of that immune system. All of this is natural. And natural is important because it's not allopathic. Allopathic is opposite cure. But no better person to talk about allopathic integrative medicine than a pharmacist. So Tracy, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so allopathic um, is just a term for whatever, you know, wherever somebody lives, kind of the uh, modern or mainstream medicine. And certainly Western medicine is is really a synonym for allopathic for us here in the States. I mean, even compared to our brothers and sisters to the north in Canada, you know, they are less allopathic uh, or they are less kind of Western medicine, um, certainly than we are, we, you know, we're the, the worst of the worst, really, as it pertains to using anything integrative, holistic or homeopathic, um, compared to the rest of the world. So it's basically we're using something, um, we're using something to treat an opposite problem as compared to homeopathy, which is, of course, like cures like. Um, you know, you talk to people who have really kind of embraced the functional approach, which really just means you'll see here in a second functional means looking for the root cause. And that's everything, whether we're talking about um, diabetes or cancer or pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's, you know, all other types of autoimmune diseases as well. Um, you know, we need to be looking for root causes rather than slapping a, a Band-Aid, you know, a, a Band-Aid on really an arterial bleed sometimes, uh, uh, you know, as it seems. So when you look at the rest of the world compared to us, you know, we're great in emergencies, right? We're great for the big stuff. But what we're really bad at is the prevention, um, the trying to reverse disease and inflammation that's already there. Um, that's just not the allopathic or Western medicine approach. So complementary or integrative medicine is really uh, using using integrative uh, or complementary or alternative approaches along with uh, Western medicine. That's what we want to become, really integrative practice.
listeners. You can get as do as deep of a dive as you want to, and it is limitless as it pertains to different ways that we can make our lives, our families' lives, and our, our patients' lives better. Um, but functional or integrative really just means we are using the best of both worlds. We're not anti-modern medicine, Western medicine, allopathic. You know, on the contrary, we are are using that because of the wonderful benefits that exist there. Um, but using alternative or complementary or integrative approaches is really the way that we should should be uh, working with our patients and with ourselves as examples for our patients. So I just and thought of another good mm -hmm. into integrative way to think about this because, you know, I see more and more and we have one in our practice and IPL and intense pulse light, intense pulse light. You can get a vascular filter. You can treat the rosacea. I've got some pretty cool pictures. I'm building a lecture right now on that. But you would say, okay, let me use intense pulse light. Well, that's not really opposite curing, right? You're just using light to kind of treat that inflammation, close down those blood vessels. But then that would be the, say, the functional side of that. But then you mm -hmm. might put someone on doxycycline for a short period of time. So now you're using, you know, an allopathic type and a light type mm -hmm. and now getting synergism out of that as more and more people are using Kind of a light therapy, low light therapy, radio frequency that Absolutely. are out there. So you can kind of do that. You can go internal with some collagen and then go external. So it's pretty cool what's happening out there. So you, you, did you cover that, Trace? Yep, I'm I'm good. So let's talk about oxidative stress. So I, you know, always looking for the simplest uh, explanation to a complicated subject, but that is really the root of so many, or, or, you know, the best minds in science and medicine think that oxidative stress, and it has been proven, um, you know, is involved in many, many different chronic diseases, um, and even, uh, you know, acute diseases. So think of it like this. If you look up at the top here where we have a stable atom and we're gonna kind of progress from a normal cell all the way to cells with oxidative stress. So here in letter A, here's a stable atom. You've got all kinds of nice paired electrons. A free radical uh, is a cell or an atom that's missing a paired electron. So it becomes unstable. So the free radical is going to take one of the electrons from a stable atom. That's what our body does on the regular on a regular basis. I mean, it's part of our homeostasis. It's part of our the way our cells work, et cetera. What we don't want to happen, however, is this to occur all the time. So picture this antioxidant. This is why we need this is why you're getting lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin. This is why I'm campaigning for a more comprehensive antioxidant approach, a more systemic approach that hits everything. Um, because if you have uh, a situation where your body has popped a cancer cell or a couple cancer cells, which we do all day long, anywhere from a 100 to a thousand is the best guess that all of us are producing on a daily basis, or, you know, your immune system is being constantly attacked and your thyroid is having a problem, whatever it is, whatever is the chronic low grade inflammation that we are uh, being exposed to on a daily basis. If we don't have a deep enough pool of antioxidant protection, your body is going to replicate damaged cells. Plenty of antioxidant offers electrons to the free radical to stabilize them. If we don't have, if we only have a puddle, if we only have a splash pad of antioxidant protection in our bodies, then we're going to have all of these healthy atoms that are going to be robbed of an electron to stabilize a free radical because your body doesn't know any better. It's just basically a normal homeostatic process. So what you end up with is is the worst case scenario, which is your body is going to replicate damaged cells. So this is what we end up with, oxidative stress. And this is just one cellular example. Normal cell, free radicals attacking the cell to take electrons, um, you know, for your body to try to stabilize that free radical. And you're going to end up with a bunch of cells replicating with oxidative stress. Your body will replicate damaged cells if there aren't enough healthy cells to replicate. And imagine what that ends up being. Maybe Alzheimer's, maybe cancer, maybe rheumatoid arthritis, maybe lupus, maybe macular disease, you know, which ends up in geographic atrophy, maybe glaucoma. I mean, the the endpoints are are limitless, really, with untamed oxidative stress. So let me answer a couple questions here, Trace. I'll give you a break uh, as I roll in. It's um, we got one from James here. It says, "What do you what do you implement when you have a high or low score 
Uh, most of my patients come in, I scan their low really quick so I don't have to get into a deep dive. I usually put them on a fish oil and a comprehensive antioxidant. And then someone else asked, how is it functional medicine if you aren't doing a full workup? Nutrient status is one piece of the functional medicine. And I agree with that. Uh, that, was, that came in without a name on it. Uh, it's one part of the functional medicine, right? So I can't really teach everything I've learned in six to eight years. However, when I go to the A4M meeting and I showed you James Laval's slide, oxidative stress is always at the top. If I said to them gut health or oxidative stress, they would be like, oh, geez, reduce the inflammation. If I gave them always choices, which one, they always go after the inflammation. So most of my patients in Western Pennsylvania come in scoring low. So this is kind of one way of kind of starting to turn it around. Um, you're right, you know, maybe I'm using the term, maybe loosely functional medicine, but I'm integrating, I'm going after a cause of a low uh, carotenoid score, which is showing us that there's oxidative stress, inflammation, and I'm just trying to stack the deck in their favor. Yeah, and, and I'll make does, a, a comment. Can I make yeah, a comment on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is absolutely a functional approach because it is, everybody has oxidative stress. So functional medicine means root cause. Everybody has oxidative stress that needs to be dealt with, um, you know, on a daily basis. And the deeper your pool of antioxidant protection, um, the better. And that is, you know, certainly treating that root cause of dysfunction. The other issue is, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have worked with a um, functional practitioner for probably close to 10 years now. And I, you know, I credit him um, with changing, changing my life um, for sure, as well as all of the other things that I've done as well. Most people can't afford that and insurance doesn't pay for it. I've paid every penny of that out of pocket um, and it's been thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So I agree with the question. I think it's an excellent um, question. The problem is there are very few places in the United States where uh, for any type of functional medicine or intervention is covered by insurance. So if we can participate as a small piece of the puzzle and at least address um, inflammation and metabolic dysfunction, et cetera, from a, a functional medicine, comprehensive antioxidant approach, gut health, et cetera, um, you know, I think that that's, that that's a proud moment for us as practitioners. So another one rolled in here. Does insurance company cover like the MPOT or any of these? They do not. Uh, you can charge for it, whatever you feel is uh, the average is about $20 out there, but we're not price fixating here. Um, and any of the devices, or I do in my practice, I scan everyone because I want to I want to see everyone's score. And you'll see why here when I talk about, you know, this one journal of nutrition. But uh, we also have a pretty good wellness package that we have about a 70, 80% capture rate. Um, and we just didn't want to drive that up any higher. Um, but they're not covered. Um, and then I'm going to hit these real quick because um, we could hope we can do a whole other talk on this. What are your feelings on intermittent fasting, longer fasting, 36 to, to, to 72? Well, Martin, I'm on a uh, I'm on my third day right now. I went to uh, Nashville. I had a great time. I know I was feeling inflamed after that. So I ate at 10 o'clock at PM on Sunday in Nashville and basically coffee and water since then, and just taking my supplements along the way and some electrolytes. Um, and it's great for autophagy as you have been there. And then please comment on leaky gut. That's the bacteria that Tr Tracy and I keep talking about the gut microbiome. I think if we would call it what it is, leaky poop, getting into your blood system and lymphatic system, poop in your blood system and lymphatic system, creating an inflammatory reaction, we would probably all focus on fixing our gut, our leaky gut. I think we just need to call it leaky poop, getting into your lymphatic and blood system, having an immune reaction, and that's why it's all over the place. But a whole other talk, but fits into here, that's out there. Um, and so, Trace, that's the questions. I'm going to let you... Talk about yeah, the this. only other thing I would add, you know, for leaky gut, then, um, I mean, there's still practitioners that don't believe in leaky gut, which I, I don't even like boggles my mind. Um, but then the next question I had, uh, optometrist asked me over the, the weekend, um, I was in Nashville as well, you know, well, what causes leaky gut? Because he said his wife, um, has been told she has it. And I said, it could be any number of things. I mean, it could be, you know, glyphosate in foods. It could be food and food sensitivities. Um, you know, it could be uh, radiation. 
be heavy metals. It could be any number of things. The problem is lots of times, unless you can get the full functional workup with the detoxes, et cetera, never going to really figure it out. So, um, you know, we're kind of hitting it where we can, but yeah, and intermittent fasting, love it, love it, you know, for the, uh, autophagy for the super long intermittent fasting and, um, the shorter fasts that's been key to, uh, to my health for sure. Uh, you know, 18 to 24 hours. So chronic low grade inflammation, this is what we keep alluding to or flat out saying, um, you know, some people call it, you know, the fire within some people call it low, low burn, some people call it subterranean inflammation. Um, but identifying all of these slow burn or low grade inflammation, inflammatory conditions, the earlier, the better, because it can really be the difference between a full recovery or a dramatically reduced quality of life um, or even death in some cases. You know, there's all kinds of of anecdotal and, um, you know, clinical trial uh, information, third party tested with supplements, et cetera. And certainly for you guys, it's vision loss and blindness. So these are some of the examples of what oxidative stress can cause. And I liked this picture because after after Greg and I put these slides together, I looked at the uh, tomato on the left and I was like, it definitely is a genetically modified tomato because it's mm. too perfect. Probably stays pretty like that for for three weeks while the rest of them are starting to uh, to grade, you know, to degrade the heirloom tomatoes. Um, but look at that list. Cancer, vision loss, heart disease, arthritis, stroke, respiratory diseases, immunodeficiencies, emphysema, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, fast aging obesity, hair loss, other inflammatory or ischemic conditions. And of course, eye, eye disease is certainly on there. And then, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, choose your parents wisely, right? We can't really do that. But, um, you know, my blonde hair, my blue eyes, my, my, you know, round fingernails, my, my stumpy, stumpy fingers, whatever you want to say, you know, those came from my parents. I can pinpoint exactly which one they came from. I can't have an impact on that, right? Unless I want to dye my hair a different color, et cetera. Um, but the nice part about really, you know, kind of getting down to brass tacks, so to speak, if you look at lifetime health where it says 8% genetics, we could say 8%, 10%, 12%. I mean, this is really a generalization. And certainly there are diseases or conditions that are more tightly linked to our genetics. But in general, if you say 8% is our genetics, that means that 92% is our epigenetics, lifestyle choices, things that we can influence. And, and, you know, some you can influence more than others, but it really is an empowering thing to consider. And when you tell that to a patient, they, they sort of stop and think, really, I, I'm, you know, I'm 55 years old. I can actually have an impact on what my life is going to look like tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And instead of just having a low quality of life for the rest of my uh, years, I can have an impact on that even at my age. Yes, you can. And uh, it's never too late until we're dead. So what we're saying here is that with this, you know, large percentage of what our body experiences is uh, lifestyle choices and changes that we can make, it goes back to turning on and turning off gene expression. So we know that genes plus our environment equal genetic expression. We're not trying to change the, the genome or even our own individual genetics per se. The only thing that we're suggesting, and it's been proven out by science, is that you can turn on and turn off uh, gene expression expression in certain cases. So, um, and a lot of those have to do with longevity and aging. So, so that's a wonderfully powerful thing. Yeah. So the epigenetics would be what I was referencing earlier, exercise, get out there, don't be sedentary, get your good sleep, do your meditation, so on and so forth. And all the different exposures that are out there. Tracy, let's talk on biomarkers. We kind of talked about a biomarker measuring carotenoids. IOP is a biomarker, blood pressure is a biomarker, but you know, well, there's different types of biomarkers you have listed here. Yeah, quite a few, right? Biomarkers are just a test that has meaning. So, uh, I mean, there are tons of biomarkers in Western allopathic medicine, and there are an equal number, if you know, more or fewer, I'm not sure, in functional medicine. But, um, you know, when you look at all of these different types of biomarkers, predictive biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers, diagnostic biomarkers, et cetera, um, you know, we have the ability to have 
to, to do a test that has meaning for our patients, along with all the other tests that you already have the ability to use as optometrists. And I think the biggest one is going to be a predictive biomarker. And, um, you know, testing the carotenoids as well as some of the other OCTs and, and uh, other tests that you do really gives us uh, an idea of what can happen to the patient in the short term and in the long term. And that's, I, I added the animation after I already said everything. Go ahead, Greg. Okay, so basically, you know, whenever I talk to the different, you know, if you want to say functional med docs, not the allopathic docs, like our primary care docs and retinologist and so on and so forth, the functional docs, some have six, some have 10, some have 15. You go to a functional medicine, Tracy mentioned it, I see one. And they'll measure and, you know, they're looking for predictive biomarkers, hemoglobin A1C, kind of predicting what that maybe insulin resistance or insulin is doing. C-reactive protein, plasma homocysteine, basically checking the inflammation, vitamin D, and it's actually a hormone, vitamin D is a hormone. It, it's produced by our largest uh, uh, organ of our body, our skin because uh, it works at the nuclear level. That's why it's a hormone. That's what they want to know, how your vitamin D, omega-3, and some will use the carotenoid levels. Maybe they'll do serum. Some use the scanners that are out there, but they want to know what's your antioxidant. So that's a predictive way of what's happening out there. And again, this is a good way, circling back, that we can do in the office, measuring someone's carotenoid levels, seeing their level of inflammation in the body, and going back to the question about, you know, how would I, if I had a patient came in, I'd say, look, I'm concerned with this 19,000. I'd be really concerned. Um, I just had a colleague of mine, I won't bring up the name. I didn't like how low his score was. And he, we actually, I sent him to his primary care doctor and he actually had some cancer in his body. Luckily we got that, that was pretty low. I see scores around 26 and 31 all day long with our great Western central Pennsylvania diet. And we want to raise them up into the green, into the blue. And what I tell the patient is when you score this low, let's try and do the cell membranes. Let's get your, your, you know, your antioxidants up in your body. Let's get your score up. And what we're doing is stacking the deck in your favor of all those things that Tracy just talked about, the hair loss, the Alzheimer's, the cardiovascular disease, the eye problems, so on and so forth that's out there. And 70% of my patients come in on a... Uh, supplement and Tracy said it, it's kind of the lie detector of you know, they think they're going to score high. And I say, look, you're already spending a buck. Why don't we go to two bucks a day or two and a half dollars and see if we can get your score up. Um, and most of them will jump on that. So now let me show you this real quick. So uh, we talk about lutein and zeaxanthin. Dr. Chris Putnam got his PhD uh, in macular pigment. So he taught me this real quick. Lutein, zeaxanthin, miazeaxanthin, they all have this OH on it. So does quercetin, so does resveratrol, curcumin. Tracy, what molecule is this? I don't know this molecule. What is this three glucose uh, molecule up here? Do we have any idea? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's one of the antioxidants, uh, but I think we know quercetin, resveratrol, and curcumin. But if you look, they all have this OH, and that OH is what neutralizes that free radical. That's why a lot of antioxidants, including lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, and carotenoids kind of being kind of the first defenders are out there. Again, I don't poo-poo them, but in pharmacology, we need the whole spectrum to become synergistic with this to reduce those oxygen species. So Chris Putnam put this together, and he's basically showing that there is evidence out there. This would be risk-adjusted, informed risk-adjusted medicine Quercetin inhibits carotid retinal neo or angiogenesis. You can see that there is there are plenty of studies out there. Now, are they randomized clinical studies that allopathic medicine likes? No, because it's hard to study chronic versus acute diseases. Acute we can study. Chronic is hard to study, but we have evidence out there for what's called risk-adjusted evidence. Uh, based medicine. And the, here's your anthocyanins, which is uh, and uh, flavonoids and polyphenols, a nice mix here. 
showing that there's evidence out there, but we can't make a claim, but we can say supports the cell membrane, supports the cell signaling, supports the immune system. Curcumin, plenty of evidence out there. Resveratrol, this was Stuart Richard's favorite when he was, um, he recently passed away about two years ago now in October, um, that uh, he loved resveratrol for what it can do for the body in its anti-inflammatory effects. And this is why I scan everyone in the practice because there was in here, you can pull this up. It's the annual review of nutrition. They were talking about carotenoids being powerful and maybe it should be a part of the comprehensive exam, like an IOP, like a pupil check, like an extraocular muscle. And they basically said that you could just measure you know, here's Raman spectroscopy. You can do reflectance. You can do the MPOD. I'm not really, really how you measure it. Just interpret it and then use a quality supplement that's out there. And you're looking for those low grade, slow burners, oxidatively stressed, and we want to raise the score. So there's DNA sciences, genomics, genetics. Again, Tracy, this is your wheelhouse. So why don't you take this slide and maybe the next few slides? So, and I, I will go back to the biochemistry question. I thought you only wanted to know what the three glucose was, but the cyanidin three glucose is like an anthocyanin, you know, like a really red, black stuff, red currants, black rice, that type of thing. Yeah. I thought you were asking only about the three glucose, which meant nothing. Yeah, you meant I'm the cyanidin three glucose. I read, I read, it, I read it too quick. So, yeah. So. <laughs> all right. So those no. are anthocyanins? Yeah. The anthocyanins. Yeah. All right. So that's all your dark stuff that's in your... Your, yeah, your that's that's hard to get, right? That's why it's blueberries and stuff are so good for you, Pakistani mulberries. So going with the genomics versus uh, the genetics. So uh, genomics and pharmacogenomics is basically looking for trends in uh, you know groups of people, um, and then making an assessment based upon that. So it gives us a lot of information, and certainly you know the the human genome itself, which I guess I don't know if it was discovered in 1950 or 1970, one of those or right around there, I can't remember. Um, but then our individual genetics or our individual genes gives us even more information. So um, like pharmacogenetics, I love because that gives us so much information regarding our individual alleles and how I met you know, metabolize um, opioids or how my body metabolizes, um, you know, lots of different drugs and substances, et cetera. But once again, insurance doesn't pay for it. And that can be anywhere from, you know, 500 bucks to several thousand. I've had it done. It's something that is available to everybody. It's just expensive. Now, epigenetics is just looking at the study of how our cells control gene expression or gene activity without changing the actual DNA. So that's what Greg and I were alluding to just a few moments ago. Um, epigenetics is really looking at what you'll hear us say and and show you on another slide our exposome all of the things that we're exposed to um on a on a day by day minute by minute lifetime um exposure so the exposome is the measure of all exposures of an individual in a lifetime and how those exposures relate to health the study of the exposome is epigenetics and um, this is just, you know, I thought a good graphic showing you all the different things that we are exposed to, um, you know, some more than others for sure. Um, but, you know, this has been studied, epigenetics and the exposome has been studied a lot. And we think that the most cru crucial, critical times, and this is, this is from conception. So from one cell to two cells, to four cells, to eight cells, et cetera. I mean, we are just inundated with... Um, different bad things, you know, even stress hormones from, from our mom, um, you know, as she's pregnant, but the most critical, we think the most critical and crucial time for exposomal, um, exposure that can be detrimental is, you know, infant, very young, um, age. So that sort of, you know, can set the tone for a lifetime of, of good things or bad things. But the good news is just knowing that no matter what age we are, we can try to reverse some of that damage and either increase or decrease gene expression, depending upon what we're talking about. So Ben came up with a question, how long have you been doing the scanner? How long have I been doing the scanner? I've been doing the scanner for four or five years now. Have I seen measurable change? Yes. I'm going to show you how drusen have started to disappear in some patients. Why not all? Go back to functional medicine, James Lavalle's slide, individuality that's out there, and all these other epigenetics. 
Um, do these scores on the whole come up in time with patients by making the recommendation? So yes, what it does is it gamifies it. They start taking the supplements, but then I had a guy come in the other day. He goes, you're going to be great. I've been eating more salmon, more salads. I had the burger, but I didn't get the fries, but I got the cow salad. I'm not trying to make people vegetarians, but I made them mindful of what they're eating that's out there. It gives um, them something that they can control. You know, when you have a number that you're dealing with, you know, when you're dealing with number that you're that you're saying, you know, this can improve if you do this, that, and the other thing. And it's not really that difficult. Um, it gives patients a level of control that they don't normally have. Um, you know, and it's something to work towards. I've done it for, uh, uh, I guess a little, maybe two and a half years, Greg. Um, I only got into it because Greg and, and several other optometry friends of mine really encouraged me to scan. And I was, you know, cocky, like, oh, uh, you know, I'm taking $420 worth of high-end supplements. I'm going to score off the charts. And I failed. I failed. Um, so, I sort of went in it as a skeptic and slowly changed, you know, specific products, et cetera. And now I'm off the charts, you know, in the purple, um, you know, it took me a while to get there, but I mean, it life changing, you know, off, uh, off my, my rheumatoid arthritis and lupus is in complete remission. You know, I was able to lose 60 pounds, um, with gut changes, et cetera. It's been remarkable. I feel 25. I feel better, better than at 55 than I did at 25. So. Yeah, I remember you, I mean, not to bring up you know something, but I remember being at the, where, where were we lecturing somewhere in the Midwest and you're like, hey, listen, and, you know, I'm it's swelling up, up and inflamed and so on and so forth. And, and uh, you know, no, look at you now, you know, you're, you were in Nashville over the weekend and you're out doing this and that. So it's just amazing to see the recovery. Yeah. yeah. So Pretty yeah, cool. definite changes in patients. So, you know, we're talking about genetics, we're talking about epigenetics, you know, epigenetics is the, our exposures, but here's someone with genes, I do genetic testing in the practice, and you know, I'll say to the patient, look, I can genetically test you, maybe this will motivate, motiv uh, uh, motivate you if you're low, high, moderate, but, you know, these are the genes, and, you know, we talk about ARMS, we talk about complement factor H, ARMS genetics, okay, ARMS is metabolism, fuel, it's burning, it's like gasoline in a car. The complement factor H, it helps bridle the immune system. If it's broken, then the immune system can be overactive, right? It's that yin and the yang, it needs to be in the middle, it's Goldilocks. So this is where now you start talking about zinc. I don't want to get too high into zinc, but I got some slides here. So when you hear us talk about arms, you hear us talk about complement factor, complement factor three, that's big right now because of the uh, synfovary that's out there. So when people come in and they score, you know, wherever on here, I want to get them in, on a comprehensive supplement. And you can see here, people will be like, oh, you know, the lutein in here is only one milligram. You're taking two a day. It's supposed to be a 10 to two ratio. Yeah, I guess if you do it by itself, that's an isolate. That's why I use that term. If you want to test vitamin E, you have to give a high dose of it to show some effect. But you don't always have to give a high dose of vitamin E as long as you have all the other teammates on. And that's called synergism in pharmacology. We like this company because they do a selection, a sourcing, a specification. So they select what they want for the for the 10, 8 to 10 servings. They source from wherever in the world. They have tight specification and standard. But what I like about it is safety, is they test for lead, mercury, bacteria, fungus, and parasite that could be in this. We don't want it in there. When I talk to the other companies, do you test for this? The answer is we send it out to third party and they test for what's supposed to be in it. That's not the answer. That's not answering my question. Are you testing for things that shouldn't be in it? Most of the answer is no. I'm not saying that the company that we recommend and use is the only company doing it. They're far and few between. But if you're looking for guidance, ask the question, are they testing for things that shouldn't be in it? And then they do studies on uh, on their products. So here we go. Here's using the immune system. Tracy was right 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Greg, you got to learn the immune system. Here is a patient. As you can see, I'm using a fundus autofluorescent. You can see this is probably about four years ago. And you can see that fundus autofluorescent does the RPE. You can see it's still active right here. This is your complement factor, three, your five, your H, your arms. 
And that's why they came out with Synfovria. I'm not going to turn this into a big, deep lecture, but you can see this is allopathic medicine trying to go after the C3 inhi inhibition. And what we can do here is we're using genetics. It's down here at the RPE level. You got an overactive immune system. Again, it's an autoimmune disease, genetically predisposition to it. And so we can do allopathic medicine, send them maybe for a uh, uh, for Iveric, which is now uh, a Stellis um, injection, or we can send them for, which is Isorve versus Synfovary. The retinologist can decide, but this is allopathic medicine. This is using some, you know, integrative medicine or using supplements to then make an, an integrative type of medicine. So what is the basis for concentration of zinc? There's always that big discussion out there, 80 milligrams, 25 milligrams. I feel that 80 milligrams is toxic. I don't like giving it all the stuff that's out there. 25 still might be high in some genetically predisposed patients. I don't say no zinc. Maybe in some cases, if they were all complement factor H being high, I would maybe avoid zinc. But my recommendation would be at least low zinc and not 80 milligrams that's out there. There's plenty of, uh, of evidence out there, complement factor H, arms, and basically what this is saying, for patients with two complement factor risk alleles and, and arms that is in a sense negative, that puts the patient at high risk. Then the American Academy of Ophthalmology came out and said, no, 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 but a lot of these were on the ARIDs too. To me, when there's controversy, the truth is somewhere in between. So here, and I'll let Tracy speak on this, and as you think about this that's out there, here's what we just learned. Two complement factor, H is high, no arms. So this is a patient that came in, low risk, so that's not high, so it's low risk on the arms, and we have high risk and high risk. There's your two. This can actually promote choroidal neovascular membrane. I would not do much zinc on this patient. So that's why if you're not genetically testing out there, I would say do a low zinc if you want to do that CYA, cover your butt, um, a bet that's out there, but I would not recommend. Remember, complement factor H, you already got a broken gene. The complement factor H is supposed to bridle the immune system. It's already broken. Zinc will actually slow it down even more. The zinc loves to be uh, and help with oxygen and metabolism. So if someone was high risk on the arms, I would definitely put a lot of zinc in there or at least 25 milligrams that's out there. So Tracy, anything you want to speak on genetic zinc or anything? Go back to that one slide. I just want to point out one thing Oops. that you, um, if I can get yeah, there. So at the top where it says results, this is what Greg was alluding to. Um, you know, the results, it says patients with two complement factor H risk alleles and no arms to risk alleles pro progressed more with zinc containing treatment compared to placebo. So I agree with Greg, you know, it's, it, there are so many different factors that come into play, but I think probably the thing that makes the most, the comment that he made that makes the most sense is, um, you know, high zinc, it doesn't seem warranted um, in 2024. Uh, I think that, you know, a lower zinc at 25 milligrams or, you know, some people say anything less than 40 milligrams uh, is enough. It's just that one small group of people with two complement factor H that, um, you know, I don't think it's caught on yet that maybe they don't need any zinc. So who knows? We'll see. But, you know, low zinc at 25-ish milligrams is probably a really good dose, a good good place to sit. So with that said, let's go quickly through some slides here, tie this a little bit, maybe some molecular structure together. Where the arrow is showing up is you've got the RPE down here, a little black space. This name has changed from the inner and outer segments on of the photoreceptors to the... Uh, to the uh, to the uh, inner plexiform, I'm not at the inner plexiform layer, but the ellipsoid zone. Um, it's changed its name over a few times. Right now, the most common name when you hear the OCT people out talking is the ellipsoid zone. It used to be the inner and outer segment of the photoreceptor. 
Uh, the photoreceptor integrity line was the other name that I was trying to think of a, about 30 seconds ago. But, you know, I, I have about 60 hours of OCT lecture that I put together, and I was trying to figure out why these different layers hyperfluoresce. And we know down here are the photoreceptors, up here is the wiring, here's the RPE and Brooks membrane. So whenever I was putting this together, this just blew my mind because mitochondria are super important. When I go to my A4M meeting, they're always trying to get those mitochondria to just be perfect that, that are working properly. So mitochondria are huge in anti-aging. So this is the mitochondria line, which is the mitochondria of the photoreceptors. And then I have OCT Connect that we put together with Julie Rodman for people that it's a safe place to go on Facebook and drop OCTs in. And someone put this out there, this reference, and I was looking and I was looking to see how, and they're right here, mitochondria of the RPE. And I'm like, what? I know what the mitochondria of the photoreceptors are, but mitochondria of the RPE, and then this is right where macular degeneration is. Mitochondria are important. I'm not going to bore you with it, but they produce uh, most of the energy. They live about 100 days. They produce 90% of the body's energy, but here's the kicker. With good comes the bad. In return, 90% of the free radicals. It's not a clean system. So the mitochondria are part of the free radicals, and that's why we're supposed to eat our fruits and vegetables. You can see a brain has about one to two million. Photoreceptors have about 500 per cell. The RPE has 700. I thought that was fascinating because that's where this disease of, of macular degeneration is. Tracy, what about inflammation? What Inflammaging, what's this all about? Well, um, it you know follows the oxidative stress, stress theory, and it's a perfect dovetail from the slide that you were just talking about with the importance of mitochondria and 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 also you know tying it to the uh, either turning on or turning off the gene expression essentially the you know basic model of uh, of longevity mitochondrial dysfunction anti-aging etc is looking back at the literal powerhouses of our entire body of, of every single cell and um talking about failing mitochondria, you know, just sort of tiring out, pooping out um, faster than than it should. And this is what is contributing, uh, you know, major factor contributing to um, not aging well, whether it's inside, outside, both. And, uh, you know, it becomes a pro-inflammatory situation with upregulation of tons of, of inflammatory chemicals that you see listed there, the cytokines, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-4, interleukin-13, Janus kinase, uh, the RANTES, interleukin-1 RA. And that's why, um, you know, just real quick, the biologics that we have, you know, when I first was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and I was taking methotrexate and Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, when that wasn't enough and my disease was progressing, I got put on Remicade and Fliximab, which is, um, dec or inhibits tumor necrosis factor alpha. So uh, it worked for a long time until it didn't work. And that's when I decided I can't, I don't want to do medication anymore, traditional medicine. Um, but, you know, I obviously was overexpressing tumor necrosis factor alpha as one of my mitochondrial dysfunction inflammatory chemicals because it worked. Now you see so many biologics out there, right? Whether it's for geographic atrophy or an anti-VEGF or RA or, you know, atopic dermatitis, it doesn't even matter. All of them are addressing some sort of chemical that is being overexpressed. And that that's why one biologic could treat seven different autoimmune diseases because a single inflammatory chemical could be overexpressed in almost any autoimmune disease that you could think of, including cancer. Uh, you know, when you look at anti-VEGF, that's a big target for cancer drugs as well as those for um, choroidal neovascularization. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And that's why I love you know sharing the dance floor with you because you're always kind of <laughs> kind of bringing it back together. I want to give credit here. Look at the title of this: Dead Batteries: The Role of Mitochondria Dysfunction in Immune in Immunological Decline. This was a lecture that I attended or. Tracy and I both attended, I think this is one at A4M from this MD. So targeting those mitochondria. So we have the free radicals. Tracy talked about this. You have a free radical can either go after the healthy cell or the antioxidant. So that's why we want to have a high score. So we're not creating those damaged cells. Tracy always teaches me or reminds me that then a damaged cell can replicate and replicate. And we don't want that that's out there. 
Oxidative stress puts stress on our cells. We talked about that. And it comes from just our mitochondria, 90%, or all of our exposures with our foods, with our lifestyles, with our mitochondria, we quickly become unbalanced. And we're supposed to eat these fruits and vegetables. I keep taking more and more pictures. What color do you think this banana was picked? Green. What color was this one? Green. How about these oranges right here? Green, green, green. These were all picked green. This is not good. The fruits and vegetables need to be on the vine the full time, not pick green, put into a chamber so I can get it in February. They're not nutrient bombs anymore. And that's why you see that it takes 21 oranges. People send me this stuff all the time. It takes, you know, eight cups of spinach nowadays to get one of one from 1970. People will send it to me. It's because things are picked green. They're not nutrient dense and this is 21 oranges up today from 1951 the equalizer of these free radicals is supposed to be our fruits and vegetables but as you can see the fruits and vegetables are picked green so now that's working against us that's out there we're not getting it here's the american rainbow i took this the other day at the it's probably not in your slide deck because i added it this was taken the other day at the uh, atlanta airport i saw the american rainbow of the blue almond joy and we got some brown there with Hershey's chocolate. And we have some nice Doritos here and some Oreo cookies for more blue and some Skittles and some Cheez-Its. And so we got some gum over here and orange being uh, being the Reese's uh, cups here. So the American rainbow is all this processed food, sugars going down, not really this that's here. So nutritional antioxidants, um, you know, we have exogenous and they're they're super important, which means you have to eat them. They're they're essential, and, and they again neutralize free radicals, repair oxidative distressed membranes. That's out there, and the comprehensive oxidative support again supports the immune system cell signaling. We talked about this. That's why we can do it in our eye care system. I'm gonna go through here pretty quickly because we have about nine minutes, and see if we can get to a few slides here, and we can finish on time. I do this live at the audience. I ask if this is the macula or is this the macula? Is this the macula or is this the macula? It's usually 50-50. This is the macula. The macula is five and a half by five and a half millimeters big. I love this because we talk about macular pigment. Yes, let's build up the, the lutein and the zeaxanthin, but we also want to treat the other ret part of the retina. And I like this here slide because it shows that to me, it's a foveal pigment and we want to address, again, it's important. Lutein and zeaxanthin are important, but I think we just need to be more comprehensive. This is my favorite one to show here. See this slide right here? Look at the oxidative stress that we're seeing. If we follow the mitochondria line of this one, which is that uh, photoreceptor integrity line, the inner and outer segment, it's pretty well intact. That's the mitochondria of the photoreceptor. I'd say this patient has pretty good vision. But when the mitochondria here, as we go across, you're seeing oxidative stress. So hopefully you're going to call this the Caldwell line because I assess like right there is not good. Oxidative stress, oxidative stress, photoreceptors, they're dying um, because the mitochondria, this 500 per cell are dying off and now they're not going to be able to produce. So we saw a lot of these slides. We see Drusen. This drives me crazy here because... It says no AMD. We shouldn't do anything about it, right? That's crazy. This Beckman classification is still being used. How can we say if there's inflammation, which we saw right here, inflammation, a broken immune system, how can we call that? And that drives me crazy. Can't always uh, believe what you read. So like I saw this here on Facebook. It says never worn. Well, she's wearing it. How could it be not never worn? So you can't always believe everything that, that you see there. So here is an angia wellness for diabetes. Diabetes is an oxidatively stressed condition. We see oxidative stress. This was really cool. Paul Chaus is a, is a great lecturer. He's up in Washington and Stuart Richard passed away, but he was the founder of the ocular wellness. Jeff Gerson, a great lecturer in retina. I don't know uh, the, the fourth doc on this paper, but what I love what they did here is they have diabetes showing all the different uh, comorbidities, oxidative stress, which we hit, 
you either die or get inflammation, which leads to retinopathy. And I love what they're doing here is they're adding this longer laundry list with lutein and zeaxanthin being down here in zinc and all the D3s and CoQ10 and curcumin and showing how it mitigates inflammation, reduces ve VEGF, but look how more comprehensive this is getting. Well, this is from the Airy slide deck. I referenced this earlier, trabecular meshwork. Here's the oxidatively stressed trabecular meshwork. Which is the fluid the aqueous is going to get through the trabecular meshwork? Hopefully, doesn't stick the Schlem's canal. Hopefully, doesn't clog the collector channels. So this is a good reason why I recommend for the axon, the the nerves, and for the trabecular meshwork, an antioxidant. This is the airy slide deck. I didn't change anything on it. And there's plenty of evidence-based medicine or uh, risk-adjusted medicine for glaucoma. Macular degeneration treatments, I think we're all aware of it. Smoking depletes our antioxidant, it triages, it can't go into the body, it's trying to neutralize the, the bad toxins, lifestyle changes, exercise, control those oxidatively stressed diseases like diabetes, hypertension. And remember, AREDS was only for intermediate and late. So here's the question I always like to ask. And if you would just go to AREDS2, right here, AREDS2, Frequently Asked Questions, National Eye Institute. So NEI, three, three acronyms, NEI, AREDS2, Frequently Asked Questions. Hit enter into your Google bar. This will be the website that comes up. The question I have is, can I take a multivitamin if I'm taking AREDS2? I thought this was fascinating. Nine out of 10 participants were taking a multivitamin. So our retinologists always recommend AREDS2 and then AMSR grid. Why not a multivitamin? That's a question that you need to ask yourself. I like to give a comprehensive supplement. So here's the AREDS. Paul Bernstein talking about measuring. He likes image-based autofluorescence, reflectance, Raman spectroscopy. And we have the hand scanner right here that he's using. This is the older model right here that this was a screenshot right from his lecture, how he's using the ramen, he's using reflectance, he's using all of them because he's a scientist. Here's an Arvo study with Paul on it saying, here's the MPOD, here's a way to measure in an image base. And basically he said, it's better to go with an image base than the subjective MPOD. Again, I don't care how you measure, as long as you measure and interpret it the proper way. He's doing a study here um, between lutein and zeaxanthin in pregnancy. He's doing a magenta study for macular degeneration and genetics. Um, but you can see he's measuring. Right here is the hand scanner. This is the old one, the Raman spectroscopy. He's using these different ways to measure to get that biomarker and to see how uh, building up the macular pigments. I'm not sure what his formulas are going to be, but it's a lot of evidence that's out there. Again, it's a foveal pigment, in my opinion. We talked about it. Um, there are ways here in oxidative medicine and cellular longevity using, uh, you could see using polyphenols and carotenoids. Again, it's synergistic. I don't think it was much surprise whenever you use them both that it's augmenting the augment, uh, uh, the, uh, the oxidative stress and inflammation. It's reducing it. It's being synergistic. So what about quercetin, resveratrol, lutein, and zeaxanthin? They start to become synergistic and start piling on each other. So measuring carotenoids in the macula, measuring carotenoids is a direct relationship of what's happening in the macula. Again, use whichever system. This is what Tracy uses. This is what I use. There's a ton of correlation between the macula, the skin, and the serum. This was at Arvo. Um, all kinds of Yale doing a 10-year study on diet and, and lifestyle changes, the phospholipid bilayer membrane. Maybe it's becoming the new standard that's out there. Maybe the nutritional magazine, as it said, maybe it will become an integral part of our, uh, of our uh, uh, exam. Here is that 478, yellow and blue make green. 478, there's that 518, so it is visible light. Hitting the yellow carotenoid, that was the Nobel Prize winning uh, technology out there. Hundreds of studies showing it as a biomarker. Again, skin, blood, macula, 
very well validated. And when you're low, you look like this. And when you're high, that's the way you look, basically stacking the deck in your favor. Going back to the oxidative stress, inflammation, hormones, immune, uh, immune balance, and individuality that's out there. Tracy, for the next couple minutes here, do you want to talk about biohacking and maybe the next couple slides? And I'll go through a case and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, we have till 1020 and then 10 minutes of questions if people have them. So we're in great shape. So this is just a term. I love it. I think it's something that is so interesting. You know, we can call ourselves and we can tell our patients that they are biohacking, you know, by making these changes in their um, you know, and what they do in terms of lifestyle and, and food and supplements, et cetera. But biohacking is literally just defined as the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you. So you have more control over your own biology. And it again, relates back to that, you know, eight, 10, 12% of our genetics from our parents. That's what's determining what is happening in our bodies. Um, and, you know, that means that, you know, 88 to 92% um, of what we do and use and, you know, see and, and et cetera. I mean, there's so many just different factors we actually have control over. And I don't follow Dave Asprey a whole heck of a lot. I'm sure he's a swell guy, but I liked his definition. Somebody who uses science and technology to make his or her body function better and more efficiently. So that was a, a great example of how we can become uh, biohackers. And that's that's what I call myself. One of the biggest, uh, on the next slide, one of the biggest uh things, uh, parts of functional medicine that I love is the gut microbiome. It is so, um, so well known to be tied to a multitude of wonderful benefits and horrific dysfunction, um, including, you know, something associated with leaky gut in a lot of people. I'm not somebody who really believes that probiotics should be taken every single day for the rest of your life. There are some practitioners who do believe that. I do believe that if you're using a probiotic and you have not seen a you know pretty good, if not profound improvement in many things associated with your gut, then you're on the wrong probiotic. Um, but the other interesting thing about this, this uh, slide here is it shows you two other circles, the prebiotics and then the postbiotics. Are, you know, when we take beneficial bacteria and I have, you know, two or three products that I really like um, for different insta insta instances in patients, but, you know, we take the beneficial bacteria because we want to recolonize our gut microbiome, right? It's our second brain. It's 85% of our immune system. You know, it's, it's connected to so many different things, but then we have to feed the good bacteria, right? You don't throw a lizard in a cage and not, not give them food. Um, you know, to keep him, him alive and healthy. So you kind of think of your body the same way. We need to feed our beneficial bacteria. Bad things for our beneficial bacteria, alcohol, sugar, et cetera. But if you look at prebiotics, these are our non-digestible carbohydrates and dietary fiber that we find in fruits and vegetables and whole grains, et cetera. That's why, um, you know, juicing is not necessarily the best way from a gut microbiome perspective, because when we juice, it pulls out uh, many juicers, it pulls out all of the fiber, you know, that is in those fruits and vegetables, um, you know, and, and you need to sort of leave the original the original integrity of that fruit or vegetable or grain, um, it, you know, as, as it was. And then our postbiotics are the beneficial chemicals that are coming from the interaction between our prebiotics and our probiotics, the things like butyrate and pure propionate, et cetera. That is what we need from, um, from our prebiotics and probiotics. Um, so gut microbiome and occasional recolonization, I think is key for everybody. Recolonization, aka swallowing bacteria. <laughs> right? So swallow the bacteria, keep them alive. Push the bad ones out, keep the good ones there. So very, very easily said, but hard to do, right? So exactly. All right. Let me run through some cases here and we'll get this wrapped up. This is a 53-year-old man that comes into my practice. This is kind of similar to what happened today. The 50-year-old that was there with mom who has macular degeneration, but mom didn't come with this 53-year-old. Basically, he, yeah, the 53-year-old man comes in and says, my, my, my dad has 43 injection. He's pre-diabetic pre with a borderline hemoglobin. So now we got a hormonal issue going on. His 20-20 vision, but his retina was clear, OCT, dark adaptation. 
but his score was 26,000. I said, I don't like this. What's going on with this family history? I didn't genetically test him. I offered it. But no matter what, I'm going to take his 26,000. I want to get it over here to the green. So what, what I was able to do was put him on this comprehensive supplement. Again, I like something that is selected its source specification standardization. I'm not turning it into a, uh, a supplement lecture because then we have to talk about everything. But someone asked in the lecture, which do we use? We like the Pharmanex brand, but we can talk about that at a different time. So I'm answering the question. I like it because they check for things that shouldn't be in it. He wanted to do something else. This was an epigenetic formula. So I put him on that. And again, with the selection and sourcing, and you can see he came back pretty quickly. I don't like doing that because skin turns over pretty quick. Skin turns over not quickly. Skin turns over 60, 45, 45 to 60 days. But he was so low at 26, and I had him on two products, that when he came back just a few weeks later, you could see that he did creep up to 33,000. And I said, okay, you're not allowed to come back for another month. We got to get this in. You got to be absorbing it. You got to change a little bit of your lifestyle. And he came back and he was 47. Started here, 26, got him to 47. He plays around in the blue. That's now stacking the deck in his favor. Benjamin, you mentioned about whether change is being done earlier. Check this out. Nine months. Here's an immune reaction mitochondria, look at the RPE scar. I, again, I do tons of lectures on OCT. These are lined up. You can see all the different variables here. Here's the RPE scar. Here's this drusen reducing. Here's that drusen disappeared. Does it happen to everyone? No. Here's another one that it happened to. Look at all these drusen. Again, I'm with the same cut here and the drusen have reversed or significantly improved. This one's a little bit tougher. You can see the ones up here. This is not an AREDS formula, right? This is that maybe no AMD. That's wrong. That's AMD. You got inflammation, broken immune system. Have we got? Have I gotten a reversal? Yes, this person certainly improved and we're stacking the deck and reducing inflammation in their body using a comprehensive supplement um, that's out there in some fish oil. So I screen everyone looking for oxidative stress. This used to be me over here, the Western Central Pennsylvania person. I was able to get my score up, as it says right there, Greg Caldwell, 63. Summertime, I tan and oxidize. So I usually drift back to about 52 to 53. Now that the days are getting shorter, I'll probably drift back up because tanning is a form of oxidative stress. 